who works and works with and supports or interacts with residents who reside in long-term care facilities. For this virtual residence rights seminar, thank you for taking the time to join us today. This year has imparted added challenges for facilities who provide care to residents. Families have ha faced barriers to having access to their loved ones, and residents have experienced great obstacles in implementing their human rights. In recognition of these challenges, we meet here today to provide clarification related to residents' rights and long-term care facilities and hope to provide you with an abundance of tools to assure residents' rights are honored. We will address questions at the end of the seminar. So please hold your questions until then. Also, would everyone please mute their computer and their phones due to feedback. Bettina, thank you. We would like to We would like to welcome our presenters, Rachel Passett, Courtney Halthus, and Zoanne Olson. We will be privileged to hear from them on the topics of residents relate, resident rights related to housing. I am Amanda Scott, the Idaho State Long-Term Care Ombudsman. I direct the State Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program, which provides advocacy for residents who reside in nursing homes and assisted living facilities. Idaho has six regional long-term care ombudsmen located in Coeur d'Alene, Lewiston, Meridian, Twin Falls, Pocatello, and Idaho Falls. Ombudsmen provide education on senior issues, receive and work to resolve complaints to resident satisfaction, make unannounced visits to long-term care facilities and provide consultation on senior matters. The presenter's focus today will be on residents' rights and long-term care facilities. And I will address rights in nursing homes and assisted living facilities. I will discuss the CMS guidance briefly and touch upon transfer discharge of residents. Bettina, I'm not able to forward the screen if you could please. When I think about residents' rights, I like to think about this personally. So I would ask you to also consider yourself and what rights mean to you as a person. As I review residents' rights, you will recognize the similarities between assisted living rights and skilled nursing home rights. As we reflect upon these similarities, it should be obvious because of our civil rights. I will refer to IDAPA code for Idaho Department of Health and Welfare 16.03.22 and sections 550 as listed in code. Residents have rights to their records, they have the right to privacy, they have the right to humane care, and their home 
is to be a humane environment. Rights to their personal possessions, personal funds, and the right to manage their personal funds. To have access to visitor of their choosing, to be free from abuse, neglect, or exploitation. They have the right to choose their own health care providers, their own doctor, pharmacy, etc. And possibly one of my favorites is the right to voice grievances and to have them addressed in a timely manner and to be able to receive them in writing. Residents have the right to gather and participate in resident and family groups, participate in activities of their own choosing, such as resident council, involvement in community access, and others, to know where the recent survey results are and to have access to them to examine the results. Access by advocates and representatives of their own choosing, access to protection and advocacy services such as adult protective services and disability rights idaho they have the right to access to the long-term care ombudsman during covid this has meant that the lo the local on ombudsman have been contacting facilities and requesting residents and resident representatives contact information Ombudsmen have also been calling and requesting to speak with residents, attend resident council meetings and care plan meetings to meet the requirements of the long-term care ombudsman program to be accessible to residents in long-term care. The right to an appropriate and safe discharge and to be part of the discharge planning process and to direct where they want to be discharged to. The same citizen rights as Americans is privileged to. This year is an election year and each facility should have received a packet of information on voting in Idaho and should share that with their residents. Facilities should assist and provide opportunity for residents to act on their right to vote. They have the right to self-determination regarding their advanced directives and end of life choices, the right to know and understand what costs will be expected of them and to be made aware of any changes in costs to them. Section 560 of the IDAPA states that facilities must inform residents at the time of admission of their rights both orally and in writing, and facilities need to post residence rights in a location that is accessible and visible by all residents. The, the Nursing Home Reform Act of 1987 set the federal quality of standards for nursing homes in the U.S. Nursing homes are required to meet these standards if they receive Medicare or Medicaid dollars. The act protects residents from physical, emotional, and social abuse and neglect. The goal of the act is to ensure that residents receive a high level of care. You will observe that the regulatory requirements for residents in nursing homes as established in the Code of Federal Regulations, reflect both those same rights as provided in assisted living facilities, but goes further into detail on residence rights. Residents in nursing home have the right to participate in their own care and have access to their medical records at the time of the request and the right to refuse medications and treatment, even if there is a physician's order. They have the right to privacy and confidentiality. Confidentiality goes hand in hand with dignity and respect. 
they have the right to choose to include their choice of a physician. Residents have the right to complain when their rights are not being honored. I like to think you might say when there's a fly in their soup. They have the right to be fully informed and to make informed decisions. <clears throat> it is difficult to follow facility rules if you are not made aware of them upon admission. March, 2000, uh, March 13th of this year, CMS released guidance which limited visitation into nursing homes for infection control and prevention of the spread of COVID. The recommendations by CMS did not classify the ombudsman program as essential workers, and the ombudsman program in the nation discontinued in-person visits. So due to CMS guidance, nursing homes were required to limit visitation within facilities, but did not require that facilities prevent residents from leaving or discharge residents immediately if they were suspected or found to have COVID. CMS announced new guidance for safe visitation in nursing homes September 17th. The ombudsman program are now able to do in-person facility visits upon their discretion. Limitations have been placed on residents and families surrounding in-person visitation, which magnifies the responsibility of the facilities to provide access through other means to residents and families. All facilities should be providing access through telecommunication at the very minimum. Also window visitation and outdoor visits to residents. And now according to CMS, access to residents in person with the direction of the public health department within the region and should have policies and procedures developed and in place to meet these requirements. Residents have the right to remain in facilities unless a transfer or discharge. So they have the right, um, they have the right unless transfer or discharge due to uh, the necessity to meet the resident's welfare is appropriate because resident's health has improved and he or she no longer requires a nursing home level of care is needed to protect the health and safety of other residents or staff, is required because the resident has failed upon reasonable notice to make payment on overdue charges, receive 30-day notice of transfer or discharge, which includes the reason, the effective date, location to which the resident is transferred or discharged, the right to appeal, and the name, address, and telephone number of the state long-term care ombudsman. They have the right to a safe transfer or discharge through sufficient preparation in the nursing, by the nursing home. Discharge and evictions is an area where there has been a lot of confusion and increase in complaints to the ombudsman program. I will refer the remainder um, to regarding discharges and evictions to our remaining presenters. I now introduce Rachel Pissett. Rachel is a staff attorney with Idaho Legal Aid Services, Inc. In addition to serving clients on issues ranging from housing, domestic violence, and senior law issues, Rachel serves as Idaho Legal Assistant Developer, a position focused on improving legal service 
provisions to seniors across the state. Prior to this position, Rachel spent eight years working on international human rights issues across the globe. Rachel completed her undergraduate degree at Brandeis University cum, cum laude with honors and graduated with a law degree from Fordham University School of Law Magna Cum Laude and Order of the COAF. Rachel is also an organizational system designer and professional facilitator. In her free time, Rachel tends to her vegetable garden and explores Idaho great outdoors with her husband, Ben, an energetic Aussie border collie, Paco. Rachel will address the landlord-tenant law in relation to long-term care facilities. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you, Amanda. Thanks to, thank you, everyone, for being here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I am really excited to get to talk to all of y'all today about um, the different laws in Idaho that apply to residents in long-term care facilities, specifically landlord-tenant law. So there are, as uh, I'm sure you know or can imagine, a number of different laws applicable to tenants in Idaho. Amanda just covered a bit about IDAPA. Um, I'm going to highlight a couple pieces of that, and then I'm going to go into landlord-tenant protections under Idaho statute, um, as well as some other protections out there that exist to protect tenants um, that apply to residents in your facilities. So. Getting an understanding, um, big picture of what we're looking at. Um, we've got state regulations in the form of IDAPA. We've got state statutes under Idaho code. And then we've got federal laws and regulations that also apply. And when we think about all of these, they're puzzle pieces. Um, we have to fit them all together. They all apply. And where there are contradictions, the more restrictive rule applies, or the rule that grants greater rights for individuals is the rule that's going to apply. And so you'll see, especially as we talk specifically to that issue of discharges, um, you know, there, there are some places where there are more restrictive rules and some places where there are less restrictive rules. Um, and it's important for your facility to understand that you have to follow every rule. So, as you know, and as Amanda just covered, there are a number of resident rights under IDAPA. Um, I'm gonna highlight just a couple of the most important ones when it comes to this issue of discharge. So section 550 of IDAPA 160322 um, gives residents uh, two particular rights that I wanna highlight. One is the ability to voice grievances without discrimination or reprisal. And the second is that, um, under transfer or discharge, each resident must have the right to be transferred or discharged only for medical reasons or for his welfare or that of other residents or for non-payment of his stay. In non-emergency conditions, the, resident, the residents must be given um, at least 30 calendar days notice of discharge and there is a right to appeal. In addition, under section 225 of this part of IDAPA, um, there are some requirements for behavior management. So where individuals um, have behavioral symptoms that need addressing, um, they have the right to an evaluation for behavior management and for the facility to develop an intervention uh, for each symptom that focuses on the least restrictive means for handling that behavioral symptom. And that's really important. I'm gonna kind of circle back to this later. Now, coming to section 221 of IDAPA, this is where we get into requirements for terminations of the admission agreement. This is, um, I know, an especially pressing topic for many of y'all right now um, because of coronavirus. And at the start of this, I just wanna say, you know, I appreciate and respect so much the work, the efforts that uh, you are all making to make sure that the residents in your facilities stay safe. Um, I know that it must be incredibly challenging um, and stressful to, um, you know, have that pressure of making sure that, um, you know, you keep your facility 
um, you know, under all infection protocols and everyone inside healthy and safe. So I recognize that there's some extra tension around this right now. Um, and that's why, you know, in particular, I want to highlight what are the requirements when, when something does need to happen. So in general, um, as the earlier section of IDAPA stated, terminating admission agreements or discharging residents really shouldn't happen unless it needs to. Um, if it absolutely needs to, um, either you need to provide the resident with 30 days of written notice, or it has to meet one of these narrower causes for a faster eviction. Um, and some of those causes include emergency conditions that require a resident to be transferred to protect that resident um, or other residents in the facility from harm, or if their condition deter deteriorates to a point where your facility no longer can provide them with the necessary care. The third scenario that would allow for a faster than 30 day discharge under IDAPA is non-payment of the residence fees. So if they don't pay, you may be able to move for discharge a bit more quickly than that 30 day standard of notice. Now, if you are trying to discharge a resident, it's important that you follow all of the requirements uh, that exist under IDAPA. So um, there's discharge planning that's required. Um, it's important that you inform residents of their right to appeal, and you need to inform them of that in writing. Um, and then you need to provide them with a written notice of discharge. Um, and Section 221 um, of 160322, uh, subpart 4, it's up on the slide right now, this includes all of the information that has to be in that written notice. So, those are the rules under IDAPA. I want to switch to tenants' rights under Idaho Code, two statutes. And uh, when I do that, I'm going to be looking at uh, and talking to you about landlord-tenant law. And that may sound a little bit surprising um, because many of you run facilities and think of yourselves primarily as medical providers. Um, and while you certainly do provide that medical care and that skilled nursing care, you're also a housing provider. Um, those of you who run, you know, nursing homes or long-term care facilities or residential assisted living facilities or certified family homes, um, you actually, uh, in addition to all of your other roles, you are a housing provider and so you're a landlord and landlord-tenant law applies in your situation. So understanding what laws apply to you are critical when it comes to making sure that you're following all the rules and regulations. So. What are tenants' rights under Idaho Code? Uh, here are a couple. Under Title 55-307, um, tenants are allowed at least 15 days of notice for any lease changes. Under Title 6-317, uh, residents might be entitled to three times the amount of actual damages uh, if something, if they were facing um, an action in bad faith. And under, under 6-320, um, tenants have the right to request repairs and receive those repairs within three days. Um, and they also have what's called an implied warranty of habitability. So when they enter an admission agreement with your facility, it's implied within there that their residence is going to be habitable. So it's going to have heat. It's going to have uh, potentially cooling. It's going to have electricity and running water. Um, you know, the walls aren't going to be crumbling. There's some basic standards. You know, there's not going to be rodents running everywhere. Um, this is going, basically, when you enter that admission agreement, you're confirming that it is a habitable environment for the tenant. Now, let's look at the part of Idaho Code related to um, discharges. Um, tenants generally have a lot of rights regarding eviction. And, and to start out, I want to make sure that we're clear on language. So unlawful detainer is what we see in the code. That means eviction, which is also a discharge. So whether uh, we say or use the word discharge, eviction, or unlawful detainer, we're talking about the same thing. So what does the Idaho Code say? What does landlord-tenant law say about the rights that tenants have when they're facing eviction or discharge? They are allowed, similar to IDAPA, 30 days of notice to terminate a month-to-month -month tenancy for any other reason, or in the case of non-payment of rent or a material breach of the lease, three days of written notice. 
That service of notice, again, must be in writing and must be delivered in person or left with a person of suitable age at the residence. Now, let's say that you're um, trying to discharge somebody. You provide them with their 30-day notice. You, uh, you follow all the requirements about what's in writing. You hand it to them. You serve it to them appropriately. Um, and we can use today as an example. So today's October 29th. Let's say you hand a resident um, a notice of, of discharge today. That means that on November 29th, if they're still in the unit, or on November 30th, if they're still in the unit, um, they are now in breach of um, that agreement, right? You've terminated their tenancy. They should no longer be there. At that point, they are in possession of that property through unlawful detainer. And so in order to get them out, that's where you actually have to sue them in court. You have to bring what's called an action for possession. Um, you file a complaint for eviction to try to get them out of the unit. It's critical to understand that in that scenario, you cannot use self-help. So you cannot lock a tenant out of their room. You cannot call the police. You cannot threaten that you will call the police as a way to force them out the door. Um, if they overstay their welcome, if you've terminated their lease or their admission agreement and they stay past that timeline, you've got to go through that court process. Part of that court process is going to include um, a tenant's right to a trial by jury in a case where there is an issue of fact. Um, and there's also the, the possibility that tenants can receive treble damages or triple damages, three times the amount of, of actual harm um, in a monetary value uh, when there's been bad faith. So those are a couple of extra rights uh, that exist for tenants. So what does this all mean, right? Because I've now gone through the, the rights that, that residents have during discharge under IDAPA and the rights that residents have under Idaho code, um, under landlord tenant law, and they conflict, right? Because it, under IDAPA, uh, we've got a situation where you can evict uh, with 30 days notice, unless it's non-payment of rent, an emergency condition that's putting that resident or other residents' health and safety at risk. And under IDAPA, you're allowed to evict or discharge immediately in those scenarios uh, with no prior notice, and the resident doesn't have the right to appeal. And when we stack that up next to this Idaho code, we're seeing, well, actually, that's not true. Idaho code says that in the instance of non-payment of rent, they need at least three days of notice. And there's not even a situation for an emergency discharge uh, for health and safety reasons, which means that it would fall under that 30-day requirement. So what do we do? Well, if you remember what I said at the beginning, um, we've got to piece these all together. And anything that provides residents with more rights, that's going to be the law that applies. And so in this scenario, uh, landlord-tenant law also applies. So if you don't give a resident sufficient notice under landlord-tenant law, you could be facing a lawsuit um, under a number of different uh, potential claims that you did not follow landlord-tenant law. So even if your facility discharges someone, let's say you've got a resident, uh, let's make this specific here. Let's say you've got a resident who walked down the hallway, took off their mask to blow their nose and you believe that a resident taking off their mask uh, in the hallway, it's a violation of COVID infection protocols. You don't believe that there's a less restrictive way to manage that behavior uh, than discharge, and you want to discharge. You believe it falls under that uh, emergency eviction for health and safety reasons, and so you hand them a notice of immediate eviction and expect them to leave that day. If you lock them out at that point, um, you have violated landlord-tenant law and could face an action in state court. Um, if you don't uh, follow the notice requirements under landlord-tenant law, the you know 30-day notice, you could potentially face an action in state court. So it's really, really important to remember you've got to follow both IDAPA, the regulations, and landlord-tenant law. A couple of other uh, tenants protections under Idaho statute um, and other areas that I want to point out. There is right now a CDC eviction moratorium. I'm sure y'all have heard about this. Basically, it's supposed to protect tenants uh, from discharge in a situation where they've lost income because of COVID-19 
and that discharge would or eviction would result in them either being homeless or living in close quarters if evicted. There's a couple of other things uh, individuals have to do in order to be eligible for this protection. For example, um, they have to make best, best efforts to obtain rent assistance and they have to make partial payments where they can. So if their rent's you know, $800 a month and they can only pay 200, um, they would have an obligation to pay that 200. This moratorium does apply to all residential properties. Um, so our best understanding at this point, this is an evolving area of the law, but our best understanding at this point is that that means that that would apply uh, in congregate living situations. Um, and of course there are exceptions for this, right? This really applies for that non-payment of rent situation, but if there's criminal activity or um, threatening the health or safety of other residences at issue, that CDC eviction moratorium uh, doesn't apply. So um, just be aware that um, where residents perhaps have not paid rent because of a loss of income due to COVID, they can fill out a declaration form. We have it available on our website um where we uh they, they would potentially gain this protection as of right now the way this is being used is that you can proceed with discharge but it won't be executed until after the order expires on december 31st so um tenants would not be able to be removed from the president from the residences um, until next year and then the last thing i want to point out are just some additional tenant protections um, related to uh, landlord-tenant law. Tenants get consumer protections, uh, which include implied warranty of good faith and fair dealing. Um, that means that you guys as businesses would need to be engaging in good faith to uphold contract terms. There's also protections under the Consumer Protection Act. Again, your facilities are businesses engaging in the open market. And so, um, you know, you really want to avoid practices that are going to be perceived as false or misleading, deceptive or unconscionable. And it's important to note that under the Consumer Protection Act, there are special provisions for seniors. Um, there uh, are treble damages or triple damages, again, available um, up, up to or, or even over $15,000. And so that can include when there's consumer protection violations um, where someone knew that the individual is elderly or, and this is critical, look at number two here, the offender's conduct resulted in the loss of their home. So discharging someone, engaging in um, bad consumer acts as a business, um, you could be facing trouble damages um, at least of $15,000 if not more. Um, if it results in the loss of the home um, and it's a, it's a bad discharge. Breach of contract is also another area where tenants might be able um, to get some protection uh, if they feel that their admission agreement has been violated in some way. Um, and then there's also tort claims. So assault and battery um, are obvious ones, but intentional infliction of emotional distress is another one. Um, I had a client who uh, was living in a residential or sorry, living in a long-term care facility and the staff really didn't like her and they were picking on her and they would come down the hallway at night like every few minutes and like bang on the walls in front of her room and so she couldn't sleep and she went weeks and weeks and weeks without sleeping and you know that wreaked havoc on her mental health and her emotional well-being. Um, that would be the tort of intentional infliction of emotional distress and there is a recovery provision for that. So all of that to say, you know, I'm obviously, I'm not here to scare you. Um, I'm simply here to try to make you aware that, you know, your facilities, while they are medical providers, um, you are also housing providers. And there are requirements under landlord tenant law that apply as well as other uh, parts of Idaho code, um, not just IDAPA. So it's critical that you look at all of that when pulling together your policies. Um, I will say that, you know, generally speaking, if you're acting in good faith, if you're trying to be good people and come up with alternatives for your residents, um, you know, you're not going to face any trouble. The golden rule really applies. Um, but these are some things to look out for. So um, with that. Thank you, Rachel. I just want to. I don't know what's going on here with the controls. Anyways, um, I've got my phone, here we go. I've got my phone number up here. Um, I'll also put my email in the chat. Um, 
I, I didn't say too much at the beginning, but just to say quickly, Idaho Legal Aid Services provides free civil legal services uh, to individuals who otherwise couldn't access um, counsel. Uh, generally speaking, you know, we're not going to help you evict somebody. Uh, we're generally more tenant side. However, if you're concerned about following landlord tenant guidelines um, and you want advice about whether or not your procedures match and you want to make sure you're following the law, uh, we would be happy to speak with you about that. So please do feel free to reach out and thank you all for your time. Thank you, Rachel. Our next speaker, Courtney Halthus, is an attorney as well as the Director of Legal and Advocacy Services with Disability Rights Idaho. She has worked out of Disability Rights Idaho Boise office since March of 2012. In addition to representing clients in guardianship, disability discrimination, and Medicaid appeal cases, she has also worked on various public policy issues through the state administrative rule and statutory change process and has worked on investigating allegations of abuse and neglect at Idaho state run ICF ID facilities. Courtney completed her undergraduate degree at the University of Nebraska Lincoln and graduated with law degree from the University of South Dakota. In addition to being an avid Nebraska Cornhuskers fan, Courtney spends her free time enjoying the Idaho outdoors with her family. Welcome, Courtney. Thank you, Amanda, and thank you to everyone who's here today to listen to us provide information on resident rights. I also want to say go big red and uh, because of the coronavirus, my Huskers are not playing this weekend. So I'm gonna count that as a win after last week's horrible loss. Like Amanda said, I am Courtney Holtis. I'm from Disability Rights Idaho. And for those of you who aren't very familiar with our organization, I'll give you a little background. We are the state of Idaho's protection and advocacy system. We're a private 501c3 nonprofit organization. We're not a state agency, nor are we associated with a state agency. We are a standalone private entity. We're part of a national organization of protection and advocacy systems known as the National uh, Disability Rights Network. There's one of our offices in every state, in some states, multiple offices, and then also in every US territory. We came to be as a result of some acts of Congress in the late 70s because of an expose that Geraldo Rivera did at the Willowbrook School on the East Coast, where he pretty much broke in <laughs> to the facility, had a camera, and recorded the truly horrid conditions that individuals with disabilities were facing in that particular facility. Uh, the congressman for that state felt that there needed to be some type of agency, some, some group whose job it is to make sure individuals with disabilities who were in facilities had some form of protection. And that's how the National Disability Rights Network came to be. We started off with a focus on uh, preventing and responding to allegations of abuse and neglect in facilities. Since that time, uh, our authorities, our powers, our duties have expanded from anywhere to assisting social security beneficiaries, maintaining employment, to assisting with employment issues with BR, voting, um, assisting individuals with traumatic brain injuries and those with mental illness and developmental disabilities as well. So I'm here today on behalf of the individuals who would be residing in long-term care facilities. Because we are a protection and advocacy system, our only clients can be individuals with disabilities. What that means is that Disability Rights Idaho would be prevented from providing legal advice to a provider or a non, someone who is, doesn't have a disability. 
it also would put us in a potential conflict of interest. So I'm here today merely to provide education on resident rights in various areas of the law. And if you have any questions about whether or not you're in compliance with these laws, I would recommend that you communicate with your attorney. Um, attorneys in our office would be happy to consult with them. Dang it, I went too far. So I wanted to show you my overview slide. Uh, what I'm gonna be talking about today are federal laws that apply to nursing facilities, skilled nursing facilities. And then family homes, et cetera. I'll touch a little bit about state law state administrative rules that apply to these facilities, and then also briefly mention the enforcement agencies who are responsible for ensuring that you're in compliance with these rules and regulations. So starting first with nursing facilities and skilled nursing facilities. The applicable law that applies when it comes to resident rights is the CMS conditions of participation. If you are a nursing facility or skilled nursing facility who accepts Medicare or Medicaid, you're probably very familiar with their conditions of participation, which you must abide by in order to receive their funds. Resident rights are detailed in in 42 CFR section 483. Amanda had covered this earlier in her presentation, so I'm not going to go through them in great detail, other than to bring your attention to the last rights that's listed on this slide, which says that residents have a right to be visited by and communicate with not only the long-term care ombudsman, but also the protection and advocacy system which in Idaho is our office, Disability Rights Idaho. So anytime we want to call or stop by and visit a resident in a facility, a nursing, skilled nursing facility or nursing facility, we have the right to do so without, being, without having a reason and without being barred from doing so. When we call and we identify ourselves as an employee of DRI, we expect our phone calls to be put through to the individual that we're trying to communicate with because that's their right under federal law to speak with us. In addition to this right uh, to be visited and communicate with our office, we also have another set of regulations that gives us special investigatory powers and authorities to investigate allegations of abuse and neglect in facilities or providers for those facilities who provide mental illness services and treatment, as well as to providers of developmental disability services. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on those special authorities because it's quite lengthy, but just know that that's a completely separate set of regulations regarding our access authority for individuals with disabilities. So now moving on to home and community-based setting providers. The applicable law that I'm talking about here is cited 42 CFR 440, um, 180, 181, and then 300 through 365. The home and community-based uh, settings regulations came about a few years back when CMS had decided that you know, these settings, uh, adult day health providers, developmental disability agencies, certified family homes, residential assisted living facilities, they need to be more community-based. There's been a huge push in the last couple decades to make these type of providers a community provider. You know, a good way to think of this is the residential assisted living facility that an individual lives in is their home. 
it's like my home and your home or an apartment that you would rent and the treatment that they receive the appearance of that home should be community focused you know it should look as close as possible as it would out in the community now this does not apply to nursing homes or icfids or hospitals it applies to those providers who receive home and community-based setting funds in order to provide those type of services. Within the home and community-based settings regulation are specific resident rights and provider requirements that have to be met in order for the provider to receive funding for these services. Providers have been expected to fully comply with these requirements in order to be a Medicaid provider um, ever since January 1st of 2017. So what are some of these HCBS setting requirements? Well, you'll notice the focus here is on integration, access, autonomy, independence. Those are the words I've got highlighted here. Integration and access. The setting needs to be integrated and support full access to the community, including age-appropriate activities such as employment, control of personal finances. The setting itself needs to be selected by the participant or the participant's decision-making authority. The participant is also to be afforded rights such as privacy, dignity, respect, freedom from coercion and unauthorized use of restraint, prevention of unauthorized use of restraint. It's also to optimize an individual's initiative, autonomy, and independence in making life choices such as their day-to-day -day activities, their physical environment, and who they decide to interact with. And finally, it needs to promote participant choice regarding the services and supports that the individual receives. In addition to those setting qualities, HCBS provider owned or controlled settings must also meet a list of additional conditions. And I've got them listed here. And I would pay particular attention to the first one, which is written agreement. There needs to be some type of lease, residency agreement, admissions agreement, or other written agreement in place for each participant at the time they begin occupancy. It has to provide protections that address evictions and appeals that are, that are comparable to those that are found under Idaho landlord tenant law. So whatever you want to call it, a lease, uh, admissions agreement, a residency agreement, it's got to have those protections that are found under Idaho landlord tenant law for evictions and appeals. So hopefully you are paying very close attention attention to Rachel's presentation on those. In addition to the written agreement, um, the provider also must provide privacy. The individual who's receiving these services has a right to have doors that are lockable by the individual themselves. They also have a right to choose their own roommates if they're in a setting where units are shared. They have a right to decorate the setting freedom to furnish and decorate sleeping and living areas. They also have rights regarding freedom and control of their own schedules and activities. They can come and go as they please, and they can participate in whatever they want to participate in. They also can have access to food at any time, not just designated meal times or snack times, but any time throughout the day, just like you and I. They also have to be able to have visitors of their own choosing at any time. Again, think of this as a home. You can have visitors in your home whenever you'd like. So, so can the individual who's receiving these services. And then finally, the uh, setting itself needs to be physically accessible. So when I talked earlier on the previous slide about paying attention to the written agreement piece. This is why I'm going to go into some more details about what this is, what it means, and where you can find this in the law. 
So the written agreement provision is found in 42 CFR 441.301, and then I've got the subsections there listed for you as well. It states that a unit or room is a physical, specific physical place that can be owned, rented, or occupied under another legally enforceable agreement by the individual who's receiving services. And it must provide at a minimum the same responsibilities and protections from eviction that tenants have under the state's landlord-tenant law. For those settings where landlord-tenant law may not apply, you still have to provide a lease residency agreement for each HCBS participant, which provides those protections that address evictions and appeals comparable to those provided under the state's landlord-tenant law. So no matter how you look at it, those landlord tenant law protections for evictions, for appeals, need to be maintained in that written agreement. So when the HCBS setting rules came to be and were in the process of coming into effect a few years back, the Idaho Department of Wealth and Welfare spent a lot of time, a lot of resources <clears throat> and effort in educating providers on what these regulations require. They put together a whole plethora of documents, including a provider toolkit that has frequently asked questions and helped providers see if they're in compliance with these regulations. Now, on this slide, I'm actually quoting from one of those documents that the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare created, and it's called the Rules and Guidance Document. And I've got the citation on the slide there where you could find it, although I may need to update that because Health and Welfare launched a new website last week. So the, the link may not be correct, but I will provide it to Amanda to amend after we're done speaking. According to the rules and guidance document, under Idaho landlord tenant guidelines, a three day written notice is permitted if a resident has not paid rent or room or board, has violated the terms of their signed admissions agreement, or has engaged in the use or production of a controlled substance in their residence. Otherwise, a 30 day notice is required for discharge or eviction. Notice it doesn't say anything about immediate discharge or immediate eviction. It states that under Idaho landlord tenant guidelines, it either needs to be a three day notice if it's one of those provisions or a 30 day notice. So, in that guidance document, the Department of Health and Welfare actually lists some things not to do. So we're going to cover what providers should not do. The following should not occur. A resident should not be forced to move out without due process, including providing adequate notice. The provider should not discharge or evict a resident for an issue that wasn't included or described in the admissions agreement that was signed by the resident. And a provider should not use an admissions agreement to force a resident to waive certain rights under house rules. An example they provide is that an admissions agreement cannot state that the resident is prohibited from having any visitors. And if you want to see um, more examples and an explanation on that, the citation is there as well. The Department of Health and Welfare also put together Another guidance document, uh, I believe I referenced it earlier, a frequently asked questions document that talks about <clears throat> uh, restrictions in an HCBS setting. And the reason they do this is one of the requirements in an HCBS setting is the requirement to mitigate risk. You know, the HCBS setting qualities are all about resident participant choice, right? And exposure to risk is a part of life. It's a part of making choices. 
And the Department of Health and Welfare in their Frequently Asked Questions document says that it's only through making choices and developing good judgment that we all learn. Everyone has the right to make choices and with choice comes some degree of risk. Now, while individuals have the right to make choices and experience the consequences of their actions, there may be times when such risks are non-negotiable. The department and HCBS service providers have a duty to ensure that known risks that are related to imminent health and safety are addressed. It's the responsibility of the participant, service provider, and the person-centered planning team to ensure that factors associated with health or safety risks are discussed, that safeguards are developed, and that strategies are implemented to keep health and safety risks as low as possible. So what do we mean by risk mitigation strategies? Well, risk mitigation is basically when the person-centered planning team gets together and identifies goals and strategies on how to reduce a risk. They need to be actively promoted whenever there is an imminent or likely health or safety risk. The strategies have to be included in the participant's plan and they have to be in place until it's safe for the participant to enjoy the full benefits of the setting quality. They can be in place temporarily, they can be in place for a long term, it just depends on the needs of the individual participant or resident. <clears throat> so you might be wondering what providers um, does this risk management or risk mitigation apply to? It applies to all provider-owned HCBS settings that have to meet HCBS setting quality requirements. It also applies to all providers of child developmental disability services, adult developmental disability services, consumer directed services, aged and disabled waiver services, and personal care services. As the slide states, for participants with an identified health or safety risk, providers have to either implement risk mitigation strategies or request an exemption to the requirements. In order to do this, you've got to have the person-centered planning team meeting. You've got to have that documented in the resident's file. A great way to look at this is coronavirus. As Rachel was describing earlier, you know, obviously uh, risk of exposure to coronavirus could potentially present in imminent health or safety risk. If there's a behavior that a participant or a resident is displaying that could be identified as the imminent health or safety risk related to the coronavirus, well, the department has said either implement a risk mitigation strategy or request an exemption to the requirement. That's what you're <laughs> It's not a policy where if the individual violates or poses an imminent threat, they're out. There needs to be some type of risk mitigation attempted. Okay, thank you. Again, these are documents and the language is quoted from those documents that were created by Idaho Department of Health and Welfare. So if you want to learn more about this, if you want to have access to these documents, you know, I can provide you with those sources uh, through Amanda, or you can find them for yourself on the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare's website. So now that we've talked about federal laws, let's dig into some state law provisions. 
Idaho Code 39, 3, uh, 3316 provides resident rights in residential care or assisted living facilities and lists them out. Idaho Code 66412 talks about rights and facilities for individuals with developmental disabilities. And the reason I have this particular code section uh, cited here is you would be surprised at how broadly the term facilities is actually defined in that particular statute. It applies to nursing facilities. It applies to residential or assisted living facilities. So if there is an individual resident or participant that has a developmental disability, please note that they are entitled to all of those rights that are enumerated in 66412. On this slide, um, I'm just providing the citations of the IDAPA code sections that may apply to you, depending on what type of provider you are. For skilled nursing facilities, there's the IDAPA 1603.02.5005, uh, which talks about the denial or revocation of a license. And looking inside those particular IDAPAs, you can see the resident right protections that need to be met. And if they're not met, they can lead to a denial or revocation of a license. There's also uh, the code sections there on the right regarding residential assisted living facilities. So IDAPA 1603.22550 talks about requirements for resident rights. And then 1603.22650 talks about the notice requirements, what needs to be in the notice that you provide. So who's enforcing all of this? Who's ensuring that providers are in compliance with these particular laws, rules, and regulations? Well, first and foremost, if you're getting money from Medicaid or Medicare, CMS is going to be very involved in ensuring that you're complying with all of their requirements in order to receive those funds. So for nursing homes, skilled nursing facilities that receive that type of money, you've got to abide by the conditions of participation. They do surveys to ensure that you are in compliance with those conditions of participation. And if you are out of compliance, you run the risk of losing your provider license ability to bill Medicaid or Medicare or accept those type of individuals in your facility. Same thing for uh, <clears throat> those who are HCBS providers. They, If you're receiving HCBS setting money because you're providing HCBS setting services, CMS is going to want to ensure and actually the state of Idaho has to verify to CMS that you are in compliance with all of those requirements. You've got that admissions agreement for every single HCBS participant, but that admissions agreement has those protections that essentially mirror Idaho landlord tenant law. And that you are employing risk mitigation strategies if an individual's behavior poses some type of imminent health or safety threat. In addition to CMS, uh, there's also the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare. The Division of Medicaid and the uh, Bureau of Long-Term Care are concerned with uh, provider status, you know, ensuring that Medicaid dollars are being spent appropriately, that there's no fraud, that uh, providers are in compliance with those Medicaid requirements. And then there's a the Division of Licensing and Certification. They are responsible for ensuring that you are com in compliance with your licensure requirements. So all of those IDAPAs that are licensure requirements, they will be looking through to ensure that you're in compliance in order to either receive or maintain your license as that type of provider. I guess before I leave this slide, I should also note that because these are the enforcement agencies for these rules and regulations, there are also the agencies that residents and their family members or someone on their behalf can file complaints to if there's any concern or if there's any violation of those rules or regulations.
And that uh, brings me to the end of my presentation. On this slide, I've got the two addresses for our DRI offices, one in Boise, one in Pocatello. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Courtney. Our next speaker, uh, Ms. Joanne Olson, is the Executive Director of the Intermountain Fair Housing Council, Inc. For over eight years, Ms. Olson has 14 years of experience as an attorney with Idaho Legal Aid Services, which she served as the Housing Specialty Chair and Fair Housing Fair Lending Project Director. Ms. Olson has had extensive fair housing training via John Marshall University, Seattle University, HUD, Accessibility First, National Consumer Law Center, National Fair Housing Alliance, and AARP. She ser served as the Board of Director on the Idaho Law Foundation and is a member of the Diversity Law, Real Property Law, Animal Law Sections, and Government and Public Law Sections of the Idaho State Bar and member of the Idaho Women's Lawyers. She is also a member of Boise City Ada County Coalition for the Homeless, NAACP, NFHA, Idaho Organizing Council, Girl Scouts, mother of two children and three dogs who live tra who love traveling with her family, playing sports, hiking, and reading. Welcome, Zoan. Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with everyone today. And I hope um, that we can, you know, please feel free to ask questions at the end or put stuff in the chat, but uh, we want to try to make this as interactive as possible. So I'm going to move the slide along, hopefully. But it works. Slowly but surely. Hmm. Oh, we got it. Good. So Intermountain Fair Housing Council has been around as a nonprofit for 26 years. We are a non-governmental um, agency, and we receive primarily funding from HUD, but um, other private grants, um, donations, um, sponsorships, and of course, um, through uh, damage awards and conciliation and settlements, uh, we receive funding. Our purpose is to pre preserve and protect and educate about the Fair Housing Act, so the Federal Fair Housing Act, Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act, um, and our, our obligation is to provide people information about housing, housing counseling, um, negotiations, referrals, resources, and in some instances, technical assistance on best practices for housing providers like we are today, uh, but also to governmental agencies, um, to housing um, and community development programs and consumers in and advocacy groups in our um, community. So before we begin today, we're going to focus really on um, residents' rights um, in residential care facilities, focusing on um, um, evictions. And as we know, under um, federal law, when we way back when um, took uh, constitutional law or maybe studied it in, you know, college or high school or elementary school, federal law supersedes state law. So we look to the Constitution to protect people's rights. And under that, federal laws will supersede state law. So some of the things that Courtney and Rachel and um, Amanda have talked about today, um, where the law is more protective um, and the higher level of law, so federal law, if it's more protective, it supersedes state law. But where the state law is more protective of the consumer, um, then the state law may um, persevere, may supersede. And so I want to give a little bit of that overview um, as to why the Federal Fair Housing Act is so powerful. So we focus on um, pre predominantly at Intermountain, the Federal Fair Housing Act. That is our mission is to make sure that people are protected from housing discrimination and or um, discrimination in program sales, rental, lending, any kind of housing transaction. And so when people call us, or people would come to our office pre-COVID or um, they email us or, or ask us questions, whether you're a housing provider for technical assistance or governmental entity, or you're a consumer or advocate or someone calling on behalf of someone, we look at these four elements of a case. We try to determine, is this an appropriate 
is this an appropriate case for our organization or is this something with which we can give um, fair housing advice or best practices so the first thing we look at is um, are is the person acting a covered housing provider and certainly all care facilities are covered housing providers under the federal fair housing act any kind of congregate setting whether you are a group home um, a residential um, residential facility um, any kind of shelter, anything like that. The Fair Housing Act has broadly interpreted um, who is a housing provider. And typically you have to have four or more rentals um, or be in the business of housing, like a property manager, a lender, um, a realtor, um, or you run a housing program. So yes, all long-term care facilities, nursing homes, assisted living, and small um, similar types of facilities, group homes, certified family homes are also covered. Two, we look at, is the person um, who is being discriminated against or who's claiming to be discriminated against in a protected class, right? So we look at, is the, is the housing transactor doing something to someone because of their race, color, religion, national origin, sex, disability, or familial status? If um, they don't, they're not a covered housing provider, they don't have four or more transactions in a year, they're not covered by the Fair Housing Act. The Idaho Human Rights Act might apply. And under city ordinance, um, most cities in the state of Idaho, larger cities, there are 14, cover um, sexual orientation and gender identity under their criminal law. So under city ordinances, specifically Boise um, and some of the other um, cities around the state and the, uh, the county of Ada County and Latah County, um, it, the, the city ordinance may apply or the county ordinance may apply that prohibits discrimination in housing, public accommodations and employment based on sexual orientation and gender identity. But in both the federal and state law, there is an implicit protection under sex. If you treat someone differently because of sexual stereotypes, it can still be sex discrimination. So that's something to be aware of. Um, we probably won't see a lot of cases in residential facilities involving familial status um, and the Housing for Older Persons Act might apply, but it's something to be aware of because everybody fits in a protected class. Everybody might be um, a covered housing provider or, or have a transaction that involves um, potentially a discriminatory act. So just be aware of that. Three, the action or the discriminatory act had to have occurred because of um, the person's protected class. So it can't be, you know, for some other reason, it has to be because they had a disability or because um, of their race or because of their religion or the lack that, you know, their non-practice of a religion. And then fourth, we look at, did this incident occur within the statute of limitations? And the statute of limitations for HUD um, is one year. So we look back one year to file with HUD an administrative complaint, and we look back two years to file in court. And when something is what's called a continuing violation, it means the discrimination is continuing to happen. Um, we look at the last date of something that still continued to happen um, for a period of time. So these are the seven protected classes, as I stated, race. Race includes Asian Americans, Caucasian Americans, uh, Native Americans, and the like. Color, the color of your skin. I always give the example of um, a situation where a housing provider um, said they wouldn't rent to people who are uh, to white trash and then used a derogatory term for people who are black. Um, and that certainly is discrimination based on color. Three, religion. That is protection under um, having a faith or the non-practice of a faith. And the, the example I give for that is there was an incident involving um, a senior complex where um, everyone was celebrating Christmas. They had wreaths on their door or some other um, decoration and one gentleman happened to put a bah humbug sign and the property manager gave the individual a um, an eviction notice and in that instance um, we notified them that that is discrimination under the fair housing act because the person had a right not to practice um, you know the holiday of christmas and so um, they rescinded that and did not take action against the individual but that's just an example of someone who didn't believe in practicing christmas uh, four is national origin discrimination. Um, that is where um, what where your ancestors, where you came from, or your ancestors came from. And if something is being done because of where you come from or because of your national origin, um, typically we'll see people who won't allow to rent because of they don't have 
um, a social security number, but may have a refugee status or may have you know, some other visa. Or under the Fair, Federal Fair Housing Act, even if someone is not documented, they are protected. National origin also applies to um, people um, in relationship to if they are limited English proficient. If someone is being discriminated against because they do not speak English well or not at all, um, then that might be discrimination. That also um, invokes what's called Title VI. If you are receiving federal funds, you have to you have to provide reasonable and free interpretation at least interpretation. That means someone who can interpret a lease or any sort of critical documents um, in that interaction with um, someone who's a potential applicant or during the tenancy at your residential care facility. Um, and in that case, um, it doesn't mean that you have to translate the documents unless the, the population that speaks, um, there's a large population of people that speak a certain language. And in Idaho, that might be um, Spanish and certainly um, which is unusual, most people don't know that, is German. There are large German-speaking um, populations. Um, I would imagine that some of them also speak English, but just to keep that in mind that at least Spanish translation might be required, and so that's something to make sure that um, um, that you pull your resources together and or that you um, access a language line or somebody to at least provide interpretation. And when you need translation, um, we have some uh, a resource page, our language access plan page on our website at www.ifhcidaho.org. I'll put it in the chat, but that's a free resource to try to access this information to make sure that you have resources to help you um, with interpretation and also translation. The fifth protected class is sex. We talked a little bit about that, it, male, female, or um, gender fluid. Some people don't identify as male or female. And also remember, um, it also addresses sexual stereotypes uh, based on sexual orientation and gender identity. If you treat someone differently, there was a senior case um, in the Midwest where um, a lesbian couple was treated disfavorably um, and um, it was a lot, the property manager um, in the facility allowed um, tenants to spit on the couple, it allowed them to treat them horribly because of their um, sexual stereotypes. Um, they didn't think they conformed um, to the sexual stereotypes of which they thought um, were the norm. And so be very, very cautious if something like that happens. You, um, as a property manager, if you're running housing, or if you're, if you're a tenant or a resident in that facility, you could also face a fair housing complaint. And the owner, even if they didn't know about it, is vicariously liable for the actions of their agent. So again, um, it's really important from the owner to the property manager, to the maintenance people, to the receptionist, everyone has fair housing training, as well as all the training that Courtney, Amanda, and Rachel provided today. It's really critical. Everybody takes this type of training. And the good thing is this is recorded. So um, it's something that all of your staff could watch at their, you know, at their leisure. The sixth protected class is disability. Again, very broadly defined, more broadly than the definition is broader than the Social Security Act, the VA benefits definition of disability, Medicaid, Medicare, very, very broadly defined, includes both physical and mental, and then familial status, or the presence of children under the age of 18. Probably not um, as applicable in this situation, but um, you know, there may be issues of having access to having uh, younger minor people visit. So just keep that in mind. Now we're going to move um, to go to what kind of actions we're seeing out in the community that might be a fair housing viola violation. One of the actions is making housing unavailable. If someone can't access your um, facility um, or you accept, fail to accept um, and they meet the terms of your, of your requirements, and you deny them because of their disability or you think they'll take too much care or their race or one of the other protected classes, that might be a fair housing um, violation. It is making housing unavailable. Some other examples are different rental charges, different qualification criteria. Uh, we saw that in Southeastern Idaho with giving religious preference to certain groups over others, even though they were not a religious facility. Um, evicting someone without, um, Evicting someone is, is in violation of the Fair Housing Act if you're doing it because of their protected class and certainly disability related. Uh, some of the examples Rachel, Courtney, and Amanda have given um, could be fair housing violations if you're evicting them because of their disabling conditions and haven't allowed them a reasonable accommodation. Uh, harassing someone, 
based on any of the protected classes could be a fair housing violation. So it's really important when you're interacting with residents or you as a resident or, or tenant or you know, a homeowner or in whatever lending situation, if you're a buyer, um, is to document the situation and investigate it um, to make sure that you get assistance um, for compliance. And so it's really important that you document and you investigate no matter um, who you are in the interaction. Another example is discriminatory terms and conditions. If you're charging people more because they have service animals or because they have a, a motorized wheelchair or you're treating them differently because um, they request repairs for the disability or um, you make all the repairs for people of one race but not another, that is different terms and conditions and that could be a fair housing violation. Um, so make sure again you document and investigate all allegations where this might be someone may come forward and say hey I think they're treating me differently they're not making repairs because you know because I'm Latinx or because I'm you know whatever religion and so those are very important to look for these things um, because they might be fair housing violations the next um, action that you might see is dis discriminatory statements as you can see from this picture, this is a really offensive um, ad because it would be direct discrimination. It's saying, I will not rent to these protected classes. And this obviously is a fair housing violation, but it also can be more subtle. It could be pictures, words, um, diagrams, things uh, on your social media, on, in your print ads, um, on your website um, that are uninviting to particular groups, or if they're all just white people or all just abled people. Um, it doesn't represent um, and welcome people um, of all protected classes. So you really want to make sure that you, if you're going to um, advertise using people, that your um, advertisements reflect all different types of people and not just one particular group. Um, best to um, advertise amenities and um, the beauty of your complex um, or your housing rather than you know focus on um, photos of people. But if you are going to do that, right, include everyone. Um, another thing is it, these these discriminatory statements can be um, things that are put in words. They can be rules. They can be um, in your lease. They can be you know communications from people via texts or via um, email. So be really really careful that you don't use different terms and conditions. Your website, social media, rules, leases should all have some sort of equal opportunity logo. The little house that tells everyone you are a fair housing provider. It's also best to have the logo that is um, of a person in a wheelchair because that shows that you are accessible and friendly to people with disabilities. Again, document and investigate if you ever receive an allegation or you're experiencing fair housing discrimination. The next kind of discrimination that we might see is steering. Um, steering is maybe lying about some, something's available or not available when it is. Um, different terms, lying about different terms and conditions. Um, in um, housing, you might see restrictive covenants where they don't allow families with children um, or they may not allow um, uh, people um, based on race, unfortunately. There's still CCNRs, covenants, conditions, and restrictions that are, are discriminatory. Um, and those may violate the Fair Housing Act. And certainly um, in those cases I just described, they probably do. Um, so we wanna make sure that you don't discriminate and say, um, in one instance, we had a, a Southeastern Idaho um, housing provider who said, oh, all of um, my white residents live in Pocatello and steered all of their Latinx, uh, excuse me, their Latinx re residents, sorry, to um, American Falls. And um, certainly in that instance, we you know, explained to them that that was steering and also a fair housing violation. So um, that's something to be aware of that you're not engaging in that practice. Again, document and investigate. The next um, type of transaction uh, that certainly, if any of those things happen, and then the person takes action, right? Let's say they get evicted because um, they have had um, a, dis a disabling um, episode and um, you know alleged um, you know behavior or something, and um, they ask for a reasonable accommodation for time to get um, you know their disability under control or their or the therapy treatments that they need. Um, and then you, on top of that, you deny it and you go to evict it, or you're a person and this happens to you, that might be retaliation under the Fair Housing Act. So you have the first violation, and then you might experience the second violation. And so it's really important not to 
in response to somebody exercising their fair housing rights to threaten or coerce or intimidate um, when they are trying to um, access or per, trying to um, access um, equally um, all provisions of their housing. Again, document and um, make sure that you investigate all of these situations. Next, it's really important to be a fair housing uh, partner, right? All of us are partners in fair housing. We're all um, trying to work to do the best that we can, especially during COVID. And that means making sure that we're protecting the vo most vulnerable in our community. And certainly um, all protected classes fall into that and particularly people who live in residential care facilities. I think the second most important thing to do is try to be creative and flexible in your interactions with tenants. You know, point them to resources, um, particularly if they can't pay rent. Idaho Housing and Finance Association has funding specifically to help people pay from one to three months of rent. Um, local community agencies are also receiving emergency funding. You can go to the HUD website and find out who in your community. That same that goes for helping with mortgage payments, helping with, um, you know, other types of resources for businesses. So this is a way to keep people housed because housing is healthcare. And the third thing is consider during COVID that residents and tenants may ask for reasonable accommodations. And when they do, you wanna have an interactive discussion. And that's gonna be the next focus because we predominantly hear the most about um, discrimination based on disability, not only in the whole state of Idaho, but nationally. And, and that's predominantly the stuff that we're hearing about the allegations um, involving residential care facilities. So disability, as I said before, is broadly defined under the, um, under the Fair Housing Act. It includes um, physical and mental disabilities that substantially limit one or more major life activities. Um, it, you could have a record of it. You could um, be regarded as having an impairment but have no disability whatsoever. But if someone takes adverse action against you, um, you could face a fair housing complaint if you treated them differently because you believed they had a disability. So it's been very, very broadly defined. The next thing um, that we're seeing, some common issues, um, are illegal evictions. And I think my colleagues discussed that well. Um, but sometimes when people have an obvious disability, um, you're not going to just immediately go to eviction. You got to follow state law, you got to follow IDAPA. Um, and you may be required to grant reasonable accommodations for time to allow people to get um, their behavior under control, to be able to address a physical disability. Um, so be aware of that. Um, they may also be able to request what's called a modification, ramps, grab bars, widening of doors, things that are applicable in that nature. Um, they may, be, they may be able to ask for caregivers or, or um, their durable powers of attorney or certain types of visitors that help them um, access your facility. And you might, if by denying them access to them, you may be um, violating the Fair Housing Act. Um, accessing PPE to make sure that they can keep themselves safe. Um, without, you know, when we've seen this type of thing, the denial of these, um, and the discrimination based on these things, it's re resulted in a higher number of people having to leave facilities, um, leaving them exposed to COVID and um, without housing and proper support. Um, and not only does it violate all the, the DAPA and landlord tenant law, but certainly fair housing law. And so the takeaway is to make sure that individuals are housed in the home of their choice um, and are ideally, you know, anywhere that they would choose to live with the proper supports and adequate funding, and that it would be um, accessible. And as I will just keep beating this horn, is that housing is is healthcare, right? We we know that that is true, um, and certainly that's what's kept us, um, those of us, um, all around the world safe during this time. Two things you might see, right? Um, under the Federal Fair Housing Act, is people may request your residents may request to. Um, have an exception um, or change in rules, policies, procedures, practices, or services because it's necessary for their disability to use and enjoy the residential care facility. Typically, housing providers will bear this cost. Um, so if they ask for a service animal, if they ask for um, their lease in large font or a notice in large font, if they ask for somebody to read um, a, you know, a notice to them or to have a garbage put closer to their bed, those are all reasonable accommodation requests. Um, and there is a guidance here from HUD and Department of Justice that gives you kind of examples or scenarios to follow. So it's really important that you read that when you get a chance. 
reasonable modifications. Reasonable modifications are changes to the premises. That might mean that they ask for grab bars, ramps, widening of doors, some change to the physical structure. There are resources out there that may help pay for those things. Um, and so it's really worth, um, typically if the resident has to bear the cost, which typically they do unless the uh, facility is federal funding, then you typically will bear the cost if you receive federal funding. Um, however, um, you know, there may be some instances where it's expensive, so there might be some ways to um, access other resources to help that help with that modification. What the landlord can do or the housing provider can do is require the um, tenant to remove the modification after unless it would benefit the whole um, premise, right? If it's a ramp that goes through a common area or a lift to a pool, you're not going to require them to move it. Again, here is HUD and Department of Justice's um, FAQ regarding reasonable modifications. It's very well written. It gives examples of when to, to grant a reasonable accommodation and when you may not have to grant a reasonable accommodation. Um, I highly recommend you read it because it's very good training um, and a good reference to have for everyone in your, um, in your uh, complex or in the facility. The most important takeaway from both um, those documents, the reasonable accommodation document and the reasonable modification document is don't just say no. So housing providers are required to have an interactive process, have a dialogue with the resident with the disability um, and um, they know best what meets their needs. They can work with a qualified professional, and I'm not saying doctor or position or person in the position to know, to help um, tell you what they need if their disability is not obvious. And so um, you might want to work, you know, you will work with them to figure out what best meets their needs um, without asking about the nature and severity of their disabling condition, because that's not per that's not permitted under the Fair Housing Act. So just you know, don't say no. So here's some common um, questions or common reasonable accommodations. Just remember, they may not use that word. They may say, I need larger font in order to be able to read the lease or my notice. So here's some examples, additional time to move out because they're a person with a mobility impairment. We have a no cosigner rule. Maybe they need a cosigner to help qualify them because of their source of income is um, a disability benefit or payment or a voucher. Um, maybe they need assigned parking that is accessible to them and it's close to their door. Um, maybe they need um, you to overlook in your eligibility criteria their FICO score or meaning their credit score or their eviction or arrest record. If um, you know it was during untreated mental illness or some other disabling condition and they've taken steps to mitigate it, you know, mitigate the threat or the concern you might have of financial liability. Um, and that would be explained in the proof of need. Um, allowing assistance animals. Remember, you can't charge for services assistance animals. You can't charge a pet deposit because they're not pets, they're assistive devices. You can't charge a fee, you can't charge um, pet insurance um, because they are like uh, an assistive device. Um, they have to have care and control. Um, and then there's other some other specific um, um, interactive um, information in there that I think is really good to have. And I highly recommend, again, HUD just released this guidance um, in January of 2020, and it specifically discusses these instances in regard to service and assistance animals. So it's really important that you read it. So when you, might you turn down a reasonable accommodation or modification if the person doesn't have a disability, right? Because reasonable accommodations and reasonable modifications relate to persons with disabilities. So they can't ask it because of their race or their color or other reasons. It has to be because of their disability. Um, if they're asking for something that's not related to their disability, if they don't make a connection, you know, if they're saying that they need um, to have a, uh, an assistance animal, but the assistance animal has nothing in relation to, to a disabling condition um, or a parking spot, but they don't have a, a physical disability or um, or a mental disability that relates to having that parking spot. Um, or they're asking you to provide a service that you don't provide, right? If it's something you don't do, but they could then, you could go back to them and say, hey, we don't provide, um, you know, we don't provide uh, cars every day to, you know, wherever you want to go, but we have um, a bus or we can help you get in connection with somebody who can give you um, accessible riding service, right? You know, either through um, a bus, a public bus service, or something of that nature. So you can engage in that interactive dialogue, say, hey, this is what we can do. We can't do this, but this is what we can do. But make sure that's something you, not, you don't truly provide. 
Um, other things that might be unreasonable might be the cost of the accommodation or modification. Um, you have to be actually, it has to actually be costly. Um, maybe your resources, maybe um, it doesn't, um, maybe there might be some other examples. Um, and modifications, maybe again, it's not related to the disabling condition or they don't have the proper permits or um, someone who is professionally um, a professional doing it um, and, you know, did a shoddy or would do a shoddy job. So um, those are things because you want to make sure they're doing it safely. So realize that under COVID-19, COVID-19 itself might be a disability, okay? And so we have to consider granting reasonable accommodations, RAs, related to COVID. That means additional time to find affordable housing. That means additional time to find accessible housing. You know, time to make sure that person um, can have their needs met. Extension of time for eviction procedures, accommodations because of to, to get help to pay rent, uh, using the CDC moratorium declaration. They might have other things that they might be able to access. So they may ask you for an accommodation related to the COVID-19 um, and you need to be aware of that it may be treated. HUD hasn't ruled on this yet, but um, I suspect they will, much like what happened in other, during other pandemics. So um, you just keep that in mind. Some of the time um, people have obvious disabilities. If I, have, if I am blind and I have a seeing eye dog, you know why I need the accommodation to your no pet rule, right? Because my, first of all, my service animal is not a pet. And secondly, you can obviously see why I need the service animal. But if it's, you don't know why, like they have an assistance animal and it's near, not clear why they need it, then you can ask for verification. You can't inquire into the nature and severity of the person's disability or ask for medical documentation because that's again, asking for nature and severity. But you can ask for them to ask a qualified professional or person in the position to know, um, to provide proof of need of why they need the animal for their disabling condition to use and enjoy the dwelling. Here are some ways that people might prove that they have a disability, you know, disability determination records that makes it obvious what dis disability they have. And that might, you know, ring a bell and go, hey, I know why. And this is all information that you're gonna wanna make sure you've kept confidential. So whoever in your outfit does reasonable accommodations, reasonable modification determinations, needs to really make sure that they keep this information confidential um, and that other people don't have access to it to use it maybe to discriminate, right? Or for other purposes. Um, you probably already do those things, but just make sure that you keep that in mind. So housing providers for sure should request, um, you know, if they don't understand what they're doing to ask the, the tenant or the resident or the caregiver or someone who's advocating on their behalf to clarify without it getting into the nature and severity. So they can do that to clarify. Um, it's also, you know, encouraged to make sure that if um, you want to, you need to document it, or if you're having to assist them that you document it. Um, and certainly for, um, you know, assistance animals that um, you follow the guidance that HUD has set out um, that I provided the link in the prior slide, um, but under um, the HUD DOJ guidance. So that's incredibly important that you do so. So, if you come to us, um, just make sure that you know that we are going to um, go through that step, that four-step process to look over a rule or, or a procedure that you might um, want to implement. So we give technical assistance to housing providers, governmental entities, advocacy organizations, um, and the same for consumers. They might call us and say, hey, I think I'm being discriminated against because of X, Y, Z, and we will receive the call or email or um, an intake over our, our, um, our website, and then we will analyze it and we will investigate it and we will see whether or not someone's being treated um, differently or, um, you know, discriminatorily based on their protected class. If we determine there's a violation, then we can try to advocate, mediate, educate, um, and then if it can't get resolved, we might file a complaint with HUD and we're not required to exhaust administrative remedies um, with HUD, the Department of Housing and Urban Development. We can also elect to file a complaint in court. And typically IFHC can, will file a complaint in federal court. Um, some uh, private attorneys file cases in state court. So um, this process for fair housing is different. You can file with HUD or you can file in federal court. If HUD gets a complaint, um, let's say after we file it or a private organization files it or the individual files it on their own, um, then they will review it 
They'll make sure that the draft complies with uh, federal regulations um, under the Fair Housing Act, and then they will um, review it and perfect it. It will be signed. Um, and then the, the individual um, who the respondent, the person who um, was alleged to have discriminated will receive a copy. They will have 10 days to file a response um, and or they may ask for additional time. HUD will try to mediate it. It's called conciliation within 100, and, 100 days. If they can't mediate it, uh, then they may ask for an additional 100 days. If it's progressing, but it's not quite done in 100 days, they might ask for another 100 days. Um, and at, during that period of time, um, if neither party can agree or parties, then it might go to investigation. They'll say, hey, conciliation or this mediation process has failed, um, and then they will send it on to investigation. If after the investigation, um, you know, they'll either find cause or no cause, um, if they find no cause, someone can still file an, uh, an individual or an organization if they still think there's discrimination and HUD made the wrong decision on it they can file a complaint in federal court or state court um, we did that in a case um, that where HUD found no cause um, and we settled our case in federal court um, but typically um, if it's a jurisdiction um, and they've done something um, HUD may make them engage in what's called a voluntary compliance agreement because they've found that they have that that the entity has actually violated. Typically that happens with those who receive HUD funds through community development block grants or other federal funding. Um, and HUD will monitor those, those agreements, um, whether they have, you know, make a determination or they settle it at HUD. HUD has the obligation to monitor any um, agreements between parties unless it's settled privately outside of the HUD process. Um, after HUD investigates it, as I've already explained, they can either, um, if they make a determination of cause, um, then the individuals can um, file um, through an ALJ. They can proceed under um, an administrative law judge, um, or they can file in federal court with the help of the Department of Justice. Um, and we recently also had a case involving a service animal, assistance animals. Um, and we elected not to proceed um, with the ALJ, with an, uh, an administrative law judge, and um, we um, resolved it before we filed it in court um, with a private attorney and um, the Department of Justice. Uh, when HUD takes legal action, you know, they are, they are acting on behalf of uh, the people, um, and um, they can bring the charges as the government actor um, and, you know, they can see damages, training, punitive damages, um, and other equitable relief to make sure people change so that it doesn't continue, the practice doesn't continue. Um, and that's, you know, that's what they can do. The individuals may, they may also seek um, payment for the individuals um, for the harm that was caused to them. And so um, keep in mind that whether it's a, uh, an administrative procedure or they go to federal court, um, the, this is the this is the process they might undergo. So you know, review this as you can at your leisure. Um, I want to make sure that we. I know I've gone through this last part quickly, but I want to make sure that if we have questions, we can discuss the information that we've presented today. Please let you know we can help you. We receive calls all the time from housing providers, consumers, um, advocacy organizations to help with forms and position statements, resources, um, advocacy. Um, helping with training, so um, and we are a free organization, um, um, and so um, we, like my colleagues, we primarily represent victims of discrimination, but we've represented property managers, housing providers, um, governmental entities, uh, consumers, so um, just keep that in mind. We are there for everyone who experiences discrimination. Thank you so much for your time, and let's, I, I, someone just asked, are there copies of slides? I do believe the PowerPoint will be sent out. So then in my slide, you can see the accessibility logo and you can see the, um, the Fair Housing Equal Opportunity logo. I just want to give you an example of what it might look like or what it does look like. Do we have questions? Let's look in the chat. Let's look. Copies of the slides, yes. We um, are going to send out the PowerPoint. I think uh, Amanda will do that. Um, are there CEUs? No, not that I know of. Um, but a uh, very good point. So it may be in the future. We, we should need to do that. That's a, a good point. Does anybody else have questions? Amanda, do you want to take over now? Yes, thank you, Zoanne. Uh, I would like to wholeheartedly thank 
our presenters for presenting these past, uh, well, Monday and today, uh, for all of their great information that they have had for us and their availability. We, we really appreciate that. Um, as far as the uh, PowerPoint, uh, we will attempt to send it out. It may be too large to send out the recording. If it is, we will have it on the Idaho Commission on Aging website. Um, but I can send out the slides if people are interested in that, if we're unable to send out the recorded version. Um, we're open now for questions. If there are any questions, um, we would be happy to have the presenters answer them for you. Five hundred milligrams. Um, there's a new question in the chat, Amanda, that says, "If after a valid 30-day notice, are we required to still feed and assist residents?" Which one of you ladies would like to take that? Well, I'll do it multi-layer. Um, Rachel or Courtney may want to answer theirs under landlord tenant um, and or ADAPA. Um, you've given them notice, 30 day notice, they haven't moved out. They still have a right to challenge that eviction. You can call it discharge, remember, I think I think Rachel said it, maybe Courtney said it too, Amanda may have said it. Just because you've given them a 30 day notice or a 30 day notice or an immediate discharge, um, you still have to go to court to evict them and they still have a right to receive all the rights they would have under um, under under landlord tenant, under fair housing and under ADAPA. That means having right to get fed, having right to be assisted. Um, and um, in fact, they can ask for reasonable accommodation. If the reason that you're giving Go ahead, what? Was I muted? Can you hear me now, everybody? You were not muted the whole time. Oh, okay. You're I'm fine. like, do you have to repeat all that? <laughs> okay. Um, then, then you should be you should be proceeding until they you're going to have to go to court to evict them. Or if they come to you um, and they the Bazelon Center, um, and I'll put that in the chat. Um, actually, you can ask for a reasonable accommodation up until they go to court. If I'm in the middle, I've successfully done it in the middle of court where we've asked for reasonable accommodation for to allow the person to stay because they've got their therapeutic treatment, they've accessed some other therapy, that whatever. Um, um, and sometimes remember, people don't um, investigate well. I've had housing providers evict people for things and then we get to court and they're like, oh, I didn't, I didn't ask them that, I didn't know that, I didn't know that other tenant was doing that, I didn't know, you know, that my employee was doing that. And so, there's some things, that's why I keep saying document, investigate, document, um, is because they have due process rights. They have due process rights, and, and you must go through an eviction to actually remove them. And until that happens, until you've exhausted all their, until that due process um, has finished, right? Until the whole process is finished through eviction, you have to comply with, you have to assist them, you have to provide feeding. They may choose to go live somewhere else, right? They may go, okay, you're going to go and you're going to file a, you know, an unlawful detainer and, and evict me. Um, and they may choose to leave. And if that's their choice, they may engage the ombudsman. The ombudsman is going to help. I think that's why it's really good to engage the ombudsman's office or, or to engage DRI or any one of us um, to try to mediate this, right? Um, as Cor Courtney said, we, we are, we tend to represent um, the individuals or the groups or whatever that are being discriminated against or, you know, tenants' rights or residents' rights, but it doesn't hurt to get help to try to mediate it. Um, so I hope that I answer that. Um, Courtney or Rachel or Amanda, do you have another additional answer? Or more stuff you want to say? 
Yeah, this is Courtney. I would add um, that's a great question for the Department of Medicaid and the Bureau of Long Term Care. Um, I would also look into the adult protection statute to see if it has any applicability here as far as abuse and neglect of a vulnerable adult for not providing food and assistance. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a pretty serious civil rights violation. It says, can we talk about facilities tell a resident that the must use, uh, oh, sorry, their designated house call providers? Sorry, what does that mean? They have to use, sorry, I don't know what that means. Like when a facility limits the, the service providers that uh, an individual can use. Ah, well, hmm. I'm gonna, I would, I'm gonna say this with my fair housing hat on, okay? Um, oh, who is muted? This is we can hear you, so okay. yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> Hello, Zoe, can you hear me? I think Zoe froze. Okay. Um, this right. is Rachel from Idaho Legal Aid. Okay, oh. sounds good. <laughs> Somebody else is on. Yes, this is uh, this is Scott Burpee. I've been doing this for forty-two years, and I have to like. We have everybody but the speakers mute. But with my fair housing hat, I'm going to say the person needs somebody who's not their regular, you know, house whatever call provider. And they need that person because of a disability. You should entertain that request. They provided a proof of need, or it's obvious why they need that other person. You need to entertain that request because there is a hospital in Connecticut that got sued because they wouldn't allow visitors and they could show disproportionately people of color and people with disabilities did not have access to visitors. And so, therefore, their um, health care, um, they were treated differently according to their health care needs. Um, and really to their disadvantage, um, certainly during COVID and not getting um, adequate healthcare measures. So I would take it very seriously about making sure you have protocols in place that don't discriminate in how you analyze whether or not they can come into your facility. Of course, you can screen for, for making sure people are safe to come in. Put on the toilet. Do oh my God. Make sure you limit it. Don't make sure that, make sure you don't limit it to, um, make sure you're not limiting in such a way that you are um, denying someone access based on a protected class. Now, Courtney and uh, Rachel and Amanda may have other suggestions, but my, I'm, my, I'm wearing my fair housing hat. This is Rachel from Legal Aid. I would agree. I think from a contract perspective, you probably could require that they use particular providers, preferred providers, um, but that if there's a reasonable accommodation request made to allow someone else in, um, you're definitely going to have to uh, engage that request in a serious way. And I think Mr. Burpee uh, said he had 42 years of experience and he had another question. I'm sorry we didn't get to hear your rest of your question. My apologies. Well, my my point was that I, I, uh, I mean, I knew the founder of COAD. I knew uh, the first ombudsman, I've been doing this forever, and I really applaud what you guys uh, do in protecting the residents. But I did want to point out that as all these protections create more hoops for providers to go through, it's created a subcurrent of residents or patients, I should say, that can't find a place to live. I've got three clients here right now on their second 30 day notice and Marilyn, the ombudsman here, has been out to talk to them all twice. They all justify assaulting the staff, assaulting other residents. If I don't want them and I call other facilities and they find out that we're the ones trying to find another place for them, they just hang up. They don't want, they don't want them because they know that they'll get caught in the same boat we are. I've had probably... I've had two Huntington's patients who killed roommates. I've had over 42 years, I've had just about everything you can think of. And as we put the protections in place, we don't put anything in place 
for these really tough clients, these really um, um, serious and persistent mentally ill clients that, and, and Huntington's patients that can be very violent, very difficult. One of my primary referral sources is, is uh, maximum security and both state hospitals. And I gotta tell you that these guys get here and 90% of them work out, but on the 10 that don't, it would bankrupt me hiring a lawyer to go through the whole eviction process all the time. And I just think we need to spend more time trying to figure out what to do with these guys than uh, um, as well as protecting everyone else. And we, we have the protections in place and I, I applaud that, but we haven't spent equal time trying to figure out what to do with the people who have a, a really hard time accessing. Um, we had one client here who started a fire twice. Sheriff's office showed up, demanded I drop her off along the freeway. Uh, we didn't, but she died later after she couldn't find any place else to live. Um, we, you know, she was an arsonist twice. The, the, these clients are very difficult to place and very difficult to take care of. And we're not making any progress. In 42 years, I've actually seen the pendulum swing the other way. And during this COVID right now, it's almost impossible to find placements for um, tough clients. So, so while we're protecting the ones who do live somewhere, we seem to have left a certain percentage out in the cold. And that's my comment. I would, I, this is what I would say to that. I, it is tough. And, and certainly some of the issues that you described are not reasonable. And a request for reasonable accommodation when someone is a direct threat to self, not excuse me, to property or other people, is not reasonable. It isn't, and that those those requests might be turned down, and that's why you involve somebody else to help with those situations because that would not be reasonable from what I'm hearing. Nevertheless, we cannot blame the law. The law is not the problem. The problem is we don't have enough housing, point blank. We don't have enough accessible housing. And people should be able to choose where they live. And when they don't have proper supports and proper environments, that is the problem. Because I agree with you, people need to be safe and you need to be able to access other types of housing to help people when um, therapies are not working to address disabling conditions. But the law is not the problem. The problem is the lack of accessible, affordable housing in our communities. And we need commitments from public and private entities to address that. And what I just said is, it's not reasonable to have those behaviors go on. That is not reasonable. But what is not also reasonable is that we don't have somewhere for people to live safely because they still will need to be housed. And yes, your facility doesn't sound like it's, and you take, if you've taken those reasonable steps and they are still doing that, that is not appropriate. So that would be my comment to that. I don't know if Courtney or Amanda or Rachel have a comment, um, but that is my response to that um, situation. This is Rachel from Legal Aid. I would agree, um, even from like the landlord tenant perspective, not just the fair housing perspective, that um, you have the right to discharge, right? And um, I hear you that it would, you know, bankrupt you to hire attorneys every time you have to go through this process, but um, I don't know that you need attorneys every time you go through this process, right? Like you can work with an attorney to get your notices in order um, and to understand, you know, even get templates together. Um, and as long as you and your teams are clear on what the standards are and you go through that process, um, that process is there to protect you as much as it's there to protect the residents. I think you know, where we're coming from when we're saying, you know, really be sure to, to follow the law and the standards, you know, we're not talking to, a, to, a, um, to situations like you're talking about, right? Where you're doing what you can, you don't want these people to go homeless, um, particularly in a pandemic, you're trying to uh, find accommodations for them. We're talking about situations that we're seeing right now where facilities are using COVID infection protocols as excuses for kicking out people that are just challenging and who they don't like. And that's the problem, right? And so, um, you know, I can, I, I imagine my colleagues uh, on the panel here feel the same way, but I can speak at only for myself in saying, um, you know, that's a situation where if you're really worried about that, you know, 
that's where legal aid could potentially help you, right? Where we know you're working with a vulnerable resident, you're trying to do the right thing, what other options are out there? That is totally a situation where we would love to help you and work with you. Where, where we're gonna, you know, be where we are paying attention and where we're starting to, you know, take up more cases and push harder is in these situations where we feel like being, people are being unfairly uh, and improperly targeted. This is Amanda Scott. Um, just this week on Tuesday, I had brought up this exact situation um, to the Community Care Advisory Council uh, with concerns about housing of individuals uh, with behaviors that are um, finding it difficult to find placement. And uh, I know that the council had um, addressed this and had worked on it in 2017, but since that time, uh, it has not uh, been addressed further. So uh, that is something that I've requested that they put on the agenda for January. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Well, it looks like we have used up all of our time. We want to thank our presenters and thank all of the attendees. And we will make this here recording available to you. Uh, thank you so very much for your attendance today. Thank you.